Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar organised by the IISD. We are the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Um, we're an NGO based in Canada and in Geneva. Um, and this is the first of two online sessions that we're organising this week that are designed to be refresher sessions essentially for delegates uh, and for other officials who are engaged in the WTO's fisheries subsidies negotiations. My name is Alice Tipping, for those of you I haven't yet met, and I lead the work at the IISD on this particular topic. Um, so for you long-time negotiators, it's great to see you all again. I hope you've had a safe and a restful summer. Uh, for new delegates uh, and new officials um, in Capital or in Geneva, welcome. Uh, and welcome to this topic. I think you'll find it's one of the most interesting in the whole trade and fisheries space. Um, per per perhaps first, a couple of quick words on uh, Zoom housekeeping. Um, you'll have noticed that as you've joined the webinar, you've been promoted from attendee to panelist. Uh, that means that you can take the floor, you can turn your video screen on so that we can see you, um, and you can also, of course, participate in the Q&A to ask questions as we go along. As you come in, we will mute all of the microphones uh, that aren't directly being used, and that's just to ensure that there isn't too much background noise or feedback from different microphones. Um, if you would like to take the floor, we'll be pausing after each presentation for some Q&A. If you'd like to take the floor, please do raise your hand. Um, that's the little blue hand that you see um, underneath the three dots on your screen. Um, if you have a question that comes up as we go along through the presentations, you can also write it into the Q&A box. Um, as moderator, I can see those questions uh, and so I can weave those into the discussion once we have some time. So feel free to do that um, if, you, if you have something that comes up as you go along. So our objective, essentially, with this webinar is to try and bring you all as negotiators and as officials a range of perspectives about the context against which the fisheries subsidies negotiations at the WTO are going on. And particularly, why and how subsidies are such a policy challenge for global fisheries. The second webinar that we run on Wednesday morning this week um, is going to look more specifically at the details of the negotiations. So with the help of many of the, uh, of, with the help of the facilitators in the negotiation, um, we're going to look at what is exactly going on in the negotiations. So looking at some of the topics that are coming up, um, looking at some of the issues that are, that are coming up and some of the questions facing the negotiators. So our idea for today is essentially to, to help you understand the context of the negotiations, the why they're going on, and the objective for Wednesday is to look more specifically at what is happening in the negotiations, all of which designed to help inform your participation uh, in the negotiations between now and the end of the year. Um, and particularly, of course, uh, the next cluster of discussions that starts next week. Um, so, in giving you this range of perspectives about the context, we're going to hear from, uh, from four experts in the topic. We're going to hear first from Marcio Castro de Souza, who's a senior fisheries officer at the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome. So he's going to give us the FAO's perspective on their, their latest data uh, on the state of, current, of, of fisheries and fisheries trade, um, drawing on the FAO's biannual SOFIA report, um, which was published late, last in July this year, so it's very up to date. Um, we're then going to, hear, in fact, he's also going to talk a little bit about how FAO instruments could be relevant and relevant sources of inspiration, perhaps, uh, for some of the negotiations that are going on here. We're then going to hear from Professor Daniel Pauling from the University of British Columbia um, uh, to give us, I guess, kind of the bigger picture, the history of global fishing more generally, um, and perhaps to, give, to help us understand with a historical perspective how we got to where we are now. Um, we're then going to turn more specifically to the question of subsidies, um, and I'll turn the floor to Claire Del Poche from the OECD, uh, who's going to talk to us about the work that they do very specifically on subsidies to fishing, um, the work that they've done over the last few years, and to introduce us to some of the policy recommendations that the OECD has, has developed uh, on the basis of their empirical and of their, their modelling work. Um, and then last but not least, I'm going to invite Ernesto Fernandez Monge uh, from the Pew Charitable Trusts, to talk about uh, some of the tools uh, and data that the Pew Trusts have developed to support the negotiations going on at the WTO. We're going to try and keep the time as closely as possible to two hours. 
Um, so, and I'm conscious that, that Professor Pauli has to leave relatively soon after his presentation. So in order to make sure that we have uh, enough time for Q&A on some of the specific information that's presented, I will pause after each of the presentations to give you the chance to raise your hand, to take the floor, um, or to bring in some of the questions that I see coming up in the Q&A. Um, so, so rest assured as you go through, you will have the, the opportunity to ask the experts questions. Um, and this is really meant to be your opportunity to, to get across some of the material, to understand where you can find more of it if you need to, um, and to put you in touch with people who understand this topic extremely well in the background, um, so that you can go into the negotiations as well, all informed uh, as you possibly can be based on the state of the art of what we know about fisheries and fisheries subsidies. So um, with that by way of quick background, that was it. Um, I might turn the, flow, the floor now to Marcio. So Marcio, I'll stop sharing my screen and invite you to share yours uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Alice. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for the invitation uh, to be here. I think it's a, it's a great pleasure for FAO to participate in such an event. And, uh, for, and also I think it's, I'll say that uh, we have been in this process of fisheries subsidies for a while, both of us. And I think it's it's always, uh, I think, uh, a mind challenging in terms of uh, thinking about WTO terms, which is always associated with a product that is produced nationally and think about fisheries. So it's always good to, to try to come up every, off, every, while in all, uh, every while to come to the basics of the negotiation. Because that is a, is a revolving issue that we, we should pay attention to. Because it's very easy for us to divert into old concepts of the negotiation process that are associated with national products. So in this very short introduction, I would like to thank for the organizing this event, for inviting FAO. And as Alice mentioned, I'm going to present a little bit of uh, the main, main findings of SOFIA and how FAO can support the negotiation process and WTO as well as uh, countries in this overall framework of the negotiation process of fisheries subsidies. Um, uh, first of all, uh, as Alice mentioned, SOFIA was just released. It's one of our, uh, it's the fisheries uh, division main publication that we publish every two years. Uh, usually, uh, SOFIA is released together with the Committee on Fisheries in FAO. That was our biggest uh, plenary event with the participation of all FAO member countries. But of course, this year we didn't have COFI due to the circumstances, but we released SOFIA uh, and we are going to have COFI in February next year. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a compendium of information. Uh, tackling about production, about sustainability, about uh, trade, about capacity, about the status of fisheries in FAO fishing areas, and also tackling about uh, every year, we do have like a, a framework of the publication that tries to guide how we present the publication. And this, this, uh, this edition, we are talking exactly about sustainability in action. So that was the theme of this uh, publication for this uh, biennial. And one thing that's very interesting is that it's a very clear picture. So we also present in the publication the challenges that FAO face, faces to get data, uh, the problems that country faces to send data to FAO. Uh, we only present data there when you have, we have the data. And we present the problems that sometimes countries face in reporting, for example, small scale uh, fishing data uh, and, other, and other aspects. So it's a very rich publication, not talking about the figures themselves, but also talking about problems that the sector faces. And uh, one, one very traditional graph that FAO presents in every single uh, presentation that we, we give talking about the global perspective of, of fisheries is how uh, aquaculture is increasing in importance. We all know that aquaculture is 
probably is not going to be covered by the new rules on fishery subsidies. But, uh, but we also can see from this graph that white capture fisheries is relatively stable around some figures in the last decade. So it's very interesting that aquaculture is becoming the major supply of fish to comply with growing population, the higher demand of animal proteins, while capture fisheries is remaining a little bit stable. And, uh, and that's one of the main topics that our, our Sophia this year addresses, is exactly why we have this situation of a relatively stable uh, fisheries, capture fisheries, and aquaculture is growing. It's very important to notice that uh, that's a very, also a very uh, characteristic graph that we, we, we use it a lot. That's the breakdown of fisheries at global terms between what is sustainable and what is unsustainable. That's the, that's the general assessment of this graph. And what we can see is that in global terms, uh, we can see that the biologically unsustainable level is increasing throughout the, the last years. Of course, we are just presenting here the global picture. Uh, we have variations based on the regions, but it's very important also to notice that in many occasions, we see the media are uh, talking about, uh, oh, 90% of the world fisheries are in danger. So uh, that's, that's my note at the bottom of this slide, that we cannot add what is maximal sustainable fish with biological sustainable. That's, that's a wrong assessment. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but the idea here is to show that we are facing an increase in the biological and sustainable levels throughout the years uh, of white capture. There is a return in audio here. Uh, and as I mentioned before, that was the global picture. But this picture changes a lot based in the regions. FAO has divided the globe into fishing regions. So those percentage here are shown to show the percentage of unsustainable stocks in some of the FAO regions. So you can see that the, 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 the diversion between these figures is huge. You can see big differences in those figures around the globe. And of course, this difference can be due to several things, including poor data. We have many cases of poor data reporting to FAO. But uh, as in, in general terms, we have very strong message from SOFIA this year. Uh, of course, fish is a major product in terms of combating hunger and poverty. We all know that, and we are going to see that later, that fish is basically produced and exported from developing countries. It, that, that plays a big role for developing countries. Mm -hmm. The role of small scale in producing fish is also very big. But however, to, to continue to grow, to continue the growth in this sector, we have to come with sustainable practices. That's, that's a, a, a way, it's not the only way, it's not the only solution for that, but that's a basic tool to continue the sustainable growth of the sector. And that comes with effective management. That comes with the development of sustainable value chain. And that comes with the development of social sustainability. That's a very important issue that is coming to the market now too. Um, in terms of, uh, I mentioned that I, I use, I, uh, about 20 years ago, I came from agriculture sector. I used to work in agriculture. And we never sometimes think about fisheries as being very important in international terms. And I was really surprised to see this graph for the first time. This is the export value of animal proteins. So fish is equivalent to the sum of beef, pork, and poultry. So we are talking about an animal protein that is very export-oriented. And that makes a lot of difference in terms also of the WTO negotiation process of fishery subsidies. 
because we are talking about a product that is, is completely export oriented. And that's a, that exported orientation is based on a, ver, on a massive participation of countries. So even the big producers of fish products, they are also big importers of fish products in opposition of other animal proteins. Because you don't have, for, for chicken, for example, you have what? 10 species of chicken that you can produce and extend trade. Uh, you not go, you, you, you go for, the, for, for the supermarket, you go to buy chicken, but you not go to buy fish. You go to buy salmon, to buy tuna, to buy shrimp. So it's, it's, a, it's a completely different set that's impossible for even big producers of fish and fish products to be self-sufficient. That's a very interesting market. Mm -hmm. So trade is a natural, it's a natural pattern for fish and fish products. And you see that, and then here it's very clear the importance of uh, developing countries in, in uh, imports and exports, particularly in exports. And of course, there are some, some effects here, like the Rotterdam effects in the Netherlands, Denmark, also some processing effects. But major, you have developing countries being major exports of fish and fish products. And if you think about the products, so, sorry, if you think about the products, mm -hmm. also you have a lot of products that are concentrated on developing countries, like shrimp, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, salmon with shield, but of course you have Norway. But shrimps and prawns are a very good example that you have both aquaculture production and you have also white capture production. That's also a nuance of the fisher sector, having those two aspects. Uh, and I, I just briefly mentioned that fishery can indeed be the source of animal protein to feed the world, the population uh, increase in the world. And uh, if what FAO is projecting for the future is that we, we project that aquaculture is going to become, to continue a big, a big supplier of fish and fish products, even surpassing uh, white capture for human consumption. But white capture is going to continue to become important. This ratio mm -hmm. of 50-50 is going to continue for a while. Developing countries are going to pay, play a major role on that, uh, particularly in Asia. And international trade, it's going to continue to be a highly tradable product. But we are going to see more import, more countries importing fish and fish products. That's an interesting aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, during the negotiation process in the WTO, uh, we have seen IEU fishing, overfishing, overcapacity, and small scale fishers as base code principles that are present in the mandate. In several, reiterated in several mandates in the Buenos Aires Declaration. So it's, those are very the, the, the raised pillars of the, we can call that way, of the negotiation process in fisheries studies. And it's important to notice that FAO has a complete set of instruments that addresses those pillars in a very comprehensive way. And maybe the most comprehensive one is exactly the FAO code of conduct that was approved in FAO in, on the same year that WTO was born, 1995. And uh, it was a set of basic axiological values, touch upon, upon government support measures, touch upon fisheries management, touch upon uh, uh, IEU fishing, touch upon very, very important topics and definitions and principles that countries can adopt into their national legislation in order to comply to a responsible fishery system. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting, this, this uh, code of conduct, in terms of providing the overall set that can be very useful for countries. In addition to that, we have two basic instruments that are very interconnected with the current negotiation process. The first one is the voluntary guidance on small-scale fisheries. 
And I, I put some characteristics here, but I'm going to highlight just one that is very uh, aligned with uh, the special differential treatment that's called in the negotiation process. In the, in the voluntary guidelines for small-scale fisheries of, of FAO, there is a basic principle that one size does not fit all in terms of policy. So small-scale fisheries is a very special sector that deserves some kind of dif different attention for that. There is this principle enacted in our, in our voluntary guidelines. And in addition to that, there is this port state measure agreement that is a quite, it's the only mandatory agreement that we have in FAO in the area of fisheries. And it was based on the international plan of action that we have one international plan of action covering exactly IEU, and it's mentioned this IPOA in the draft in the chair draft text. And the idea is exactly to avoid products that have been captured uh, on IEU vessels to reach any national market. That's the basic idea of the PSMA. Mm -hmm. uh, just coming, going to, to finalize my presentation, I think it's also important to mention the SDGs because the SDGs, at the beginning, there was a big discussion that if the SDGs are, they are going to be in opposition of the negotiation process. No, they are supportive of negotiation process. The SDG just try to reinforce the negotiation process. And it's very interesting to notice that some companies are already marketing their products, including fish and fish products, stating that those companies are contributing to the achievement of some SDGs. Yeah. So if some companies can do that, governments can also do in terms of trying to do that, their best in order to achieve the SDGs. So uh, it's interesting to see this, how for the first time maybe we, have, we are seeing something that uh, a UN general principle, a general set of, uh, of uh, goals and targets are setting by the public, by the, by the private sector to show that they are helping to reach those, those interests. And to mm -hmm. finalize, I just would like to mention something. Information is based on fisheries. We do have a, a, a very huge problem of uh, information gap in general, but in fisheries, it's even harder to manage information. And, uh, and this, this issue about information has impact on stock assessment, has impact on uh, pro IEU notification, subsidy notification, and others. So I just would like to stress to newcomers and people that are already in the negotiation process for a while, that FAO, we do have a project called GoFish, the website address is there, that we try to provide as much as possible information and capacity building actions involving trade of fish and fish products uh, to support countries and the private sector. And uh, so Alice, again, I think I, I tried to keep in my, it was 17 minutes, sorry for going two minutes above, but my limit, but uh, I, I just tried to, to bring a, a general overview. And I just would like to stress yeah. again that uh, this issue that FAO, uh, we are here, we are member driven organization too. So we are here to support countries and to provide technical assistance whenever possible during the negotiation process and hopefully to implement a future agreement on fisheries subjects. So thank you very much on that. Thank you for leaving me. Um, first of all, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and invite you to share yours with your slides now if you'd like to. And Marcio, thank you very much. That was extremely helpful. Thank you. So um, I will... Um, can you hear me well? Um, Perfectly, thank I, you. I will talk about fisheries expansion, overfishing, and the role of subsidies. And um, basically, I will start the story in 1880 when uh, mm -hmm. the first uh, trawlers using fossil fuel were launched in Great Britain. And um, the catch uh, of these boats uh, increased very rapidly. 
and they quickly depleted uh, the waters around Great Britain and had to work uh, offshore. They went further and further offshore. Uh, the two world war interrupted this and these uh, steam vessels, which uh, were are very inefficient by today's standard, they were enormously efficient by the standard of the time. <coughs> and they, they wiped out all other forms of fishing, really. Uh, <clears throat> the, the result is that in Britain, uh, they have about 5% of the fish left in, in the water that they had at, before these boats were unlashed, 5%. Mm. Uh, and Britain has become, from a major exporter of fish, a major importer. Now, this uh, growth of uh, fishing effort uh, driven by fossil fuel uh, <clears throat> has found itself uh, reproduced in, um, in <coughs> all the countries of the world and uh, especially in Asia. So this is the growth of fishing effort as measured by, <clears throat> as measured by uh, the added uh, power of all engines in the fleet. And you can see that the, 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 this growth is, in, is crazy and uh, is not sustainable and it goes on. And uh, you can see also that <clears throat> Oceania, North America, and Africa don't really count in this. Uh, what is important is in Europe and especially in Asia. The boats have become bigger also, in addition to being more. So the engines are bigger, uh, the emissions are bigger, and so on. And this <clears throat> means that the, the, the present catch, even though, if it, even if it were uh, uh, a constant, and I will argue that it is not, uh, hmm. is being caught by more and more vessels. That means is being shared by more and more vessels. That means the biomass in the water is less. The catch per effort is getting less and less. Um, now, <clears throat> we have a database. We have created a, a database that has cost millions of dollars to create. It, it has involved hundreds of scientists in 200 countries and territories of the world that uh, gives besides subsidies by country in, in great detail, uh, the so-called reconstructed catch. That is, um, thank you, the catch that um, the previous uh, uh, speaker mentioned the problem with data. Countries are completely overwhelmed with the, with the job of providing detailed information on their fishing activities. And uh, the, what they send to FAO is only part of the catch. Uh, for example, no country reports the recreational fishing, even though it can be very important. No country reports uh, the, uh, the, the discarded fish, the fish that they throw overboard. The FAO explicitly doesn't want this. No country report uh, subsistence fishing. And the reporting of small scale fisheries is very, very problematic. It's, it's essentially not reported. For example, in the UK, every vessel under 10 meters, what it catches doesn't count. So in the US, everything that is caught within 20 miles is, doesn't count. And for all this reason, the catch of the world is underreported. And uh, we have uh, in 2016 mm. published a, a big paper based on an enormous amount of data complementary to FAO. Then in other words, we built on top of FAO. And the result is that we catch about 50% uh, more fish overall than FAO reports. And also there is a trend since 96 in both data set FAOs and uh, the one that we reconstructed of decline. Uh, the decline is is faster in the data that we compiled for the simple reason that when a country reporting to FAO improve its statistical system, and they do because FAO works with them and teach the, the countries how to report better, they 
the catch increases, but the catch is not retroactively improved. Say, if a country therefore uh, did not report its um, artisanal fishery, and now they do, they do not correct the data retroactively. The result of it is that mm -hmm. it looks like they have an increase, while in fact they don't. And um, this problem is, is, is uh, I call it, we, we call it presentist bias, and it is mentioned in Sophia, uh, uh, in the last Sophia, no, previous one, as a problem really for FAO data the, that is acknowledged. And so basically, you, this expansion that I mentioned um, uh, can be represented by looking at where the catch was important in terms of its impact on the ecosystem, in terms of the primary production, the grass of the sea that is consumed by fisheries. I would not go into the detail how it's computed, it's actually simple, and it was published in 95 the first time in a paper published in Nature. But this was the situation uh, in the world in 1950. You can see that only around Europe and North America and Japan with countries with industrial fisheries where the, was the impact uh, visible. Um, uh, they were fisheries all around and uh, coastal fisheries all around the world, but it was not really visible. And uh, so we will move now decade by decade I have this on an annual basis. This is more impressive. And uh, this is the situation that we have now. I'm in the process of updating. So the, the notion of unfished area is um, the, the, the question that you ha just had, Alice, about mm. fishing more is, is actually, is actually uh, besides the point. Uh, it, it was rightly uh, emphasize that you cannot fish everything because if you fish the the small fish for example the big one will not recover because they need food so the fish that you don't the stock that you don't uh, that you don't uh, uh, target they are not surplus because they mm -hmm. are required within within the, the the system anyway that is the situation when you can ask yourself how was this this expansion? How was it funded? Well, it was uh, that's where subsidies come in, right? But the result of all this all all this uh, fishing is that we have modified the world. We have modified the world because at the, at the beginning, uh, every country. And I remember when I was a, a young man, I was fishing in Indonesia. We were catching the big fish in the Java Sea. They are gone now, and the bottom had been modified uh, because uh, we use trawlers, and uh, they, there is now it's now mud bed, mud flat, and there is no more, no more big fish. And that is the North Sea, that is uh, the North Pacific, that is the, the 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 South China Sea. That is essentially what happens in all countries, and and this will serve as a warning. This is, this is, this is pictures that are made, have, made, made, have been made in China. Half of the Chinese catch in the domestic water consists of this trash. And it, it, half of it cannot be eaten by people. Nobody would eat that. And is used as fish food. And this is a disaster. Uh, China, obviously has a market for this fish, for this trash. Uh, and that this is aquaculture. But you can see that aquaculture therefore consumes fish and it consumes even more fish. So it is actually not correct to show the, the world fishing catch plus aquaculture. Because aquaculture to a large extent and an increasing extent consists mm -hmm. of carnivorous fish. And these carnivorous fish are eating this. So you can have the fish as food or you, as feed, or you can have the aquaculture, but you cannot have both. This is double counting. And this is a problem that 
that we have mm -hmm. in the representation that FAO uh, uh, present because uh, aquaculture to a large extent, about two thirds, consists of herbivores, uh, animals that you don't have to feed with uh, flesh. And these are a net addition to, to, to see of seafood to the world supply. But about one third of aquaculture in the world is carnivores, the, the farming of carnivores, salmon, uh, tuna, uh, sea bass, and so on. And they require this food. So you cannot delink fisheries and aquaculture, and you cannot say, for example, that fisheries will replace, uh, aquaculture will replace fisheries. Uh, or moreover, again, you cannot present both fish that you have caught and fish that you have farmed because one is required to produce the other anyway. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 what you would talk about, what you will talk about is how subsidies have been driving this expansion that I have shown you. And basically you start with too many boats. It, you can have a situation where in a country there are too many boats. They, they have been uh, growing as when the stock was abundant and they are there. You have the opportunity you should have phased them out, decommissioned them, but no, taxpayer money has been used to fund the, the expansion of these boats. Our boats, for example, from Europe have been going to West Africa. That is an old story. And then from West Africa, they had to go around in East Africa and then fishing all over the world. You can see, uh, for example, Spanish vessel, are fishing in a, in, in, a south, in, a, in a Western Central Pacific for tuna. And China, you, the Chinese expansion is mind boggling. Uh, it started later and it's no more noticeable, but basically uh, all industrial country have expanded the fishery and expect to maintain the, the catch and to maintain the supply of fish that the citizen need um, through by fishing somewhere else, and instead of rebuilding the 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 fish that they have, and in fact there is one only one country in the world that is making a serious effort at rebuilding the, its own stocks, and that's the U.S. None of the other countries is doing that. Uh, they are really exporting the the excess fishing effort and and compete via subsidies against the other countries. And basically, the, this is a bit, that it looks technical, but actually it's very simple. You, 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 as, you, as you began fishing, uh, you generate a catch, and at some point you, you continue fishing, the, the fishing effort, it will decrease. So the job is to maintain somehow the fishing effort at a, uh, at a certain level, a uh, mineral level, so that you produce what is known as maximum sustainable yield. Now, that is if the fishery, if the governments don't intervene, it, the, the benefit that you get, which is the, the, the difference between the cost line and, 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 and the cost line, the straight line from the origin uh, and the return line, the benefit would be plowed in the increase of effort. Theoretically, it, it should stop when the cost line and the return line cross. But at this point, at this point, policymakers intervene and they make an error. They believe that, uh, that like that subsidies work in fisheries, like, like in other areas of of industrial or agricultural production. If you, if you put subsidies in manufacturing or in agriculture uh, that are translated into machinery or into, into, uh, into fertilizer or into watering and so on, you get a bigger output because the subsidies are 
contributing to the production itself of the product. But fishing effort is not an input, is not a productive input. Fishing effort is just collecting the fish that nature itself produces. So yes. with more fishing effort, you don't produce more. Past a certain point, which is known as MSY, past this point, fishing more produce less. This is something that is very mm -hmm. difficult for, for politician to accept. But, and now, if, if you have reached the so-called equilibrium point, if the costs and the benefit are, 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 are in balance, that is, you just get enough to keep going. It is very tempting to believe the, the, the fishery, the fleet owners, the fleet operators will tell you, give us subsidies and we will fish more. They, well, it's true, they will make more money because the line, as it goes down, the straight line, generates again an income for the fleet, but it generates less fish. And this is a situation that for society as a whole, this is the reason why we have an enormous increase in fishing effort with us, with subsidies, but we don't have an increase in catch. We have, in fact, a decreasing catch worldwide, and mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether it's actually an increase in effort, or an increasing catch or a stable catch that uh, suggested by the uh, official statistics or uh, our improved statistics suggest a decline. It doesn't matter because the increase in effort is, is not contested. So if you have an increase in effort, but not an increase in catch, this is because the biomass, the fish in the water have declined. And at that point, subsidies have the effect of decreasing your catch. And that, that is something that is not accepted by people who have been trained in agronomy or in manufacturing because it doesn't seem to make sense. How can you, how can, can a situation where you, where you, where you put boat in the water, all of a sudden generate less catch, while in fact before it generated more. In the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, when you were on the left side of, of the curve, putting more boats in the water had the effect of generating more catch. And all of a sudden, the good thing that you did before is turning into its opposite. Well, that is because boats are not producing fish. Boats are just collecting them. And uh, basically, subsidies have to be this gotten rid of because if we don't get rid of them, you can imagine a situation where to help the fishing, we will give more and more subsidies and this curve goes down, the fishing fleet operators will continue to be happy because, because they make a profit, but they make a profit because we subsidize them from other sectors. And you can have a situation where the cost of fishing is so low, is so low that uh, the, the, you, you fish, a completely reduced catch. That is what happens when you have impoverished fishers in many third world countries that are exploiting, that are catching one kilo a day. And when I was a young man in Indonesia, that's, that marked me. I saw a boat going out in the morning with six men and coming back with three kilo of fish at the end of the day. They caught one pound of fish per, per fisher per day. This is not in, enough to keep them going nutritionally. Uh, not mm. a, and that was, that was at a time when we were introducing trawling in, in Indonesia. They were already overfishing the coastal waters. So you can imagine the enormity of the problem that we are creating for ourselves. Basically, subsidies uh, can be split into three categories. Um, the, the beneficial subsidies would be things like managing the fishery, doing science on it, uh, security, ensuring the safety of uh, the, the fleet 
and the security of the of the operation that is beneficial subsidies the capacity enhancing subsidies are the one that we must get rid of this is the one that uh, the reduced fuel the credit to buy the boats the credit to maintain them the the uh, the capital injection to the, the cheap loans uh, the the the, uh, the abolition of taxes when you import secondhand boats and so on. All of this are in, increase your ability to fish at low cost. And slavery is also, and there is a, an increasing amount of slavery in, in fishing in uh, the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. Slavery is also a form of subsidy because it reduces the cost of fishing uh, because you don't pay your workers. Ambiguous, mm -hmm. ambiguous subsidies are things that you're not sure uh, are on the effect. For example, decommissioning subsidies, that is subsidies that you get for getting rid of your boat, can be very good because they get rid of a, of a boat that is in excess. But if the money is used to buy a new boat, uh, that is uh, very bad uh, mm -hmm. because the new boat will be even worse. So they are ambiguous and uh, they are also, uh, yeah. And uh, these figures, uh, are, they, are grad they are about $35 billion, one third of the value of the ex vessel value of the, of the uh, fisheries. And uh, my colleague, uh, Rashid Sumaila, you probably know of him. Uh, he, he works on that and he has updated them and they are available on our website uh, in detail for every country of the world. Mm. And uh, I conclude with, uh, with um, three remarks, uh, three remarks uh, about uh, fisheries. They are not, fisheries are not difficult. The, the first point, do not subsidize industrial fisheries. If they, can, if they cannot make money on their own, that means the stock are overexploited because when a fishery uh, starts and there is lots of fish, remember, they, they do not make fish, they just collect them. And they have, if there are enough fish around, they will make money. The moment, the, basically you get a signal from the stock itself that tells you I'm overfished. That's when you don't make money catching them. And if you cannot make money catching fish that mother nature produces, you don't need subsidies. And you, you should uh, set conservative quota, which allow for rebuilding the biomass, because this race uh, abroad, this fishing elsewhere, instead of repairing one's own water, the, one's own stock, is a problem in fisheries, that fisheries expand spatially instead of fixing their own problem at home. And mm. We need marine reserve, large ones, as many as possible, because otherwise we will lose the fish that maintain fisheries, that represent and support fisheries. Thank you very much. So clear, perhaps the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alice, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, you see the slides, everything? Perfect, okay, thank you. Super. Well, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to present work that we're doing at the OECD, uh, hoping it can help governments uh, identify priorities for, for reform in this, in this negotiation. Um, what I'm going to present is trying to highlight what we know about how um, fisheries subsidies operate, and then also what we know in terms of what types of subsidies are being um, you know, used and to, to what extent. Um, as you know, um, governments support fisheries with a range of objectives, such as maintaining coastal employment, um, supporting fisher welfare, or maybe uh, encouraging food pro uh, production, which is also maybe a reason why people um, do uh, subsidize aquaculture, but that's another, <laughs> another issue. Another discussion. Uh, <laughs> um, but while attempting to do so, government support can also distort um, the economic uh, environment in which fishers operate. Wow. And in doing so, uh, by lowering the direct cost of fishing, um, they can have a, a range of possible negative e effects. And these include the buildup of excess fishing capacity, meaning you have too many 
too many vessels to chase the fish that is out there. Um, then too many fishing actually taking place and, you know, um, overfishing, that's what we call overfishing. Then you are uh, putting the, the, the sustainability of fish stocks at risk, as well as incentives to engage in illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. Because, of course, um, there is no clear distinction between um, legal fishers and fisher engaging in IUU fishing. There's a whole spectrum of fishing activities and the same people who, um, you know, fish legally can also sometimes overfish or do things that are not particularly um, legal. And so it's really difficult to just um, separate subsidies uh, that would go to, um, to legitimate fishing and, and those that would go to IUU fishing. Mm -hmm. So whenever uh, subsidies encourage the buildup of excess capacity or overfishing, there's also a risk that it will uh, provoke um, IUU fishing. With SDG 14 and in the WTO negotiations, uh, I think there's consensus uh, among the international community uh, that, reform, that su supportive fisheries needs to be reformed such that at least it doesn't harm the sustainability of resources. So that's a clear uh, place to start from. However, it's it's quite difficult to, um, to identify those subsidies that are positive or negative in terms of sustainability. And this is because a number of factors and interaction between those factors are at stake when uh, the, 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 a subsidy impacts um, resources. I, these are, are described on, the, on this slide and include first the type of support policy, the type of subsidy, and this is maybe the, the easiest factor to, to examine when, when, um, when looking at the impact um, of subsidies. But then there's also the management system in place in the fishery that is receiving support, and uh, in particular whether in that fishery there is a cap on the total amount of fish that can be, that can be caught. Um, whether uh, deterrence of IEU fishing is, is effective in that fishery, and finally the health of the stocks that are being caught by that fishery. So all of these factors interact to determine the impact of the subsidy on resources. Which means the situation is a bit complex, but at the same time, economic analysis uh, points to a number of key uh, principles that can guide reform and which in fact mean that reform is possible and is not um, as complex as what I've just said might, uh, might suggest. The first, um, the first important point we know is that policies lowering the cost of inputs are those that are most likely to encourage unsustainable fishing. Um, so in particular, um, policies that lower the cost of variable input, and that's fuel vessel, uh, fuel, sorry, uh, mainly, uh, are those that encourage overfishing most. And then uh, payments that lower the cost of vessels and gear are those that encourage overcapacity most. And this in turn encourages overfishing and IUU fishing in the long term because the life shelf, the shelf life of a vessel is pretty long. So when you subsidize vessels, you encourage overfishing for as long as a vessel can be used. Um, so that's, a, that's a, an important one too. And uh, you can see on that, on that graph that um, uh, sums all support that is reported to the OECD uh, by OECD member countries, but also by um, 10 emerging economies that have large fisheries, and that includes China uh, in particular. Uh, you can see on that graph that both fuel and vessel and gear account for a large share of the support that is being uh, given by, by these countries. Um, together, they account for about a third of all support. And when we talk about support at the OECD, we, we, we see support as something that's broader than just subsidies. So this also includes all the money that would go to management, to uh, control, to data collection. Uh, and despite you know, the fact that we see support in a broader understanding than just subsidies, fuel and vessel and gear still account for a third of all the money of all the public money being spent. So it's huge and it means there's a, there's a very large scope for, for reform there. Uh, one additional caveat to this graph is that a number of countries who actually subsidize fuel to sub to, for fisheries also subsidize fuel for other sectors, in particular agriculture, and as such they don't um, recognize these subsidies as being specific to fisheries and they don't report it to the OECD for that reason. So we know that what's, what's on the graph for fuel is actually an underestimate of the, of the reality. 
And then you can see that uh, you know, quite a significant amount of money is also going to infrastructure and to capacity reduction, which are um, potentially risky as well. Capacity reduction is, is, a, is a type of support that Daniel Poli just referred to, you know, those, those, um, those payments where in theory, the fisher is supposed to, uh, to sell and stop operating its boat. But in fact, um, in practice, we know the money usually comes back into the fishery and it's not efficient at actually uh, reducing capacity. So all of that to say, there's lots of money going to the types of, of subsidies that are um, supposed to be the worst ones in terms of sustainability. And so there is scope to redirect that money to other types of, of, of subsidies that are much more um, efficient uh, and much less harmful in terms of the, of the sustainability of resources. Mm -hmm. The second important uh, point to keep in mind, I believe, is that effective fisheries management is essential to limit the scope um, for support or subsidies to create incentives to fish unsustainably. And this also improves the, efficiently, the efficiency of support uh, in increasing uh, welfare, the welfare of, of fishers. And it's, and it's really, uh, it's a really important point. It means um, that when uh, the total amount of fish that can be caught is capped into a fishery, well, basically, even though if you have more boats or, um, or inputs are, are less expensive, you still cannot uh, fish beyond that limit. So basically, it really mm -hmm. sort of, uh, of, um, limits the scope for, for unsustainable fishing. However, the problem is uh, no country has perfect management of its fisheries and perfect enforcement of that management. We know that about a third of assessed stocks are overfished. We heard that from, from Marcio uh, before. And actually, in recent data we collected at the OECD, we find um, the same uh, sort of proportion of stocks being overshipped in the countries we work with. So, you know, it's not only a global figure, it's, something, it's also something that applies uh, to rich countries uh, or, you know, to OECD member countries. Uh, we also know uh, that a significant share of the most valuable fisheries are still not uh, under total allowable catch limits with no cap on the amount of fish that can be, that can be caught. And of course, uh, while it's hard to estimate, we know IEU fishing still pervades the global economy. So with this in mind, um, um, it's important to, have, to be extra cautious when you subsidize stocks that are already overfished, when you subsidize uh, fisheries that target stocks uh, for which you have little or no information in terms of their of their health and it's important to be very cautious when you subsidize fisheries that are open access um, where you know there is no limitations on, on how much can be can be caught uh, or fisheries that are particularly subject to IEU fishing and in fact um, those fisheries tend to be the same those that are not well managed are also so those that are that tend to be overfished and a number of these fisheries are in the high seas but not but not only. Mm -hmm. And the last, um, the last sort of, of, of lesson from that is that um, parallel to efforts to, to, to reform fishery subsidies, it's also really important to improve fisheries management at a global scale uh, mm -hmm. and including through regional cooperation for those stocks that are shared um, such that um, whatever kind of support is used, good fisheries management is in place um, to avoid, uh, to avoid um, any, any harmful consequences for the, for the sustainability of resources. The last point which I want to make, and, oops, sorry, um, and which I think is in, important in motivating reform, especially in the current context, is that if you redirect support um, to uh, more sustainable types of subsidies, you will also have very positive impacts on welfare and on equity, because we know that the same types of subsidies are those that are the most harmful uh, to resources, and also those that are the least efficient in transferring uh, income to fishers. And that's particularly the case uh, of fuel subsidies, which uh, of course accrue to those who consume the most fuel, those being large uh, industrial fisheries. And in fact, in some, in some uh, contexts, uh, fuel subsidies can even be det detrimental to the small scale fishers for whom increased competition from the industrial uh, fisheries who receive lots of support will, be, will uh, more than um, 
then compensate the little benefits they gain in, uh, in, in, in cheaper fuel. So, okay, fuel is cheaper, but then they, they have so much more competition and so much less fish to chase that in the end, they're, they're worse off. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's really important uh, in the context of the of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, there is need for social uh, assistance. There's there's fishers that do need assistance, but it's not with these types of support policies that um, that support will be effectively given. And uh, redirecting money away from those types of subsidies can both uh, help the resources and help the fishers who need who need support. It's also important to keep in mind the, the, the point that Daniel Poli made earlier, that um, all support that in the end creates overfishing is detrimental to fishers and all fishers in that case, because they are less resilient and the, their future prospects are, are affected. Um, and the, 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 maybe this last slide is to, um, to just show the, the, the data that the OECD is working on and hopefully we'll soon be able to, to publish. Um, as I said, we, we collect information on, on subsidies to, to, to support, on support, sorry, to the fisheries sector for all OECD member countries plus uh, a dozen uh, of emerging uh, economies. And we um, publish details, we classify them, and we present them in a way that makes them comparable um, across, across country. Uh, for 2018, uh, we now have a total of, of 9 billion uh, US dollars going to, um, to the fishery sectors of those 39 countries that report data to us. And that's approximately 10% uh, of the value of lending. So it's not, um, it's not negligible. Now that, that as I said, comprises um, very useful types of support going to the management of the fisheries, going to data collection and production and other types of support. And it includes um, um, transfers that are, that are much less positive in our view, such as, such as input, um, input support. And so um, towards the end of the year, we will, um, we will publish the review of fisheries that discusses all this data. And that will include country notes with data at the level of individual countries, which I think uh, countries might find useful. So I've just um, included here an example of the types of graphs we are now <coughs> building to, to uh, present this information. Um, and when we do that, when you look at, at data at the level of one particular country, it's important to always put it in context because the size of, of countries, of course, plays a lot. So if you look just at the, at the um, nominal value of transfers, China was, will show up all the time, but it's just due to, to, to the size of the countries. And uh, it's interesting to look at, for example, uh, money going to fishery services relative to fleet size. So by units of, of gross tonnage, for example. And if you look at direct support, which uh, usually is granted with a view to help fishers uh, and increase incomes, you can look at that relative to employment, for example, to have a better idea of, um, of the types of, of, of transfers. Um, being made. Um, voilà, that's about um, everything I wanted to say. I'm happy to, to, to get questions. And I also want to say that any country who's not yet working with the OECD and who would like to report information about their, their, um, their support to fisheries and work with us, we would be more, uh, more than happy to do that. Thank you. Claire, thank you very much indeed. That was extremely helpful. I suspect we may be calling on you again as the negotiations evolve to go a bit deeper into this concept of what forms of support governments can usefully provide to fishers um, while ensuring that they're not contributing to, to overcapacity and to overfishing. Um, with that, we have only a few minutes left, but I do want to make sure we have a few, uh, enough time for, for a presentation and for some Q&A as well with Ernesto Fernandez. Um, so Ernesto, if you're still there, you've been the most patient of everybody. Um, I will stop sharing my screen now and invite you to share yours, please, for the last part of the session. Well, yeah, my name is Ernesto Fernandez. I'm the officer for the MD Hamper Fisheries Subsidies uh, campaign at the, at the Charitable Trust. Um, the goal of our project is to, 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 to help WTO members uh, fulfill their mandate uh, to end uh, harmful fishery resources by the end of the year. I hope that's still the case and we're pushing for that and, and hoping for that. Um, today I will uh, present what I hope will be compelling evidence of, of, um, for need to, to agree on, on ambitious uh, disciplines uh, at the WTO. Um, 
I think I'm not going to expand on this. I think uh, Marcio gave a, you know, uh, a very deep presentation about the SOFIA report. But here, the important thing to, to highlight yeah, is the, the, the further decline on the, the, uh, the unsustainable uh, fisheries, uh, now at 34%. And this decline uh, is uh, uh, one of the drivers of this decline is the, the harmful fishery subsidy, and that's why an ambitious uh, agreement of the WTO is of the most important to try to uh, revert this, uh, this trend. Um, yeah, as we know, and then we have repeated this, this message uh, once uh, many times, is, you know, this, we need to also revert this vicious or eliminate this vicious cycle Fishers ask for government for assistance, for support the, the livelihoods, and, and then they go fish and they go for you know longer time and and further and then for a while they uh, are better off. And then when the fisheries uh, uh, and the stocks decline, they go and ask for more uh, subsidies to be able to to even go further and for more time. And I think this has, was highlighted by by the pre, uh, the previous speakers. I think this is important that we address. Um, and subsidies are, you know, artificially increase, um, increase the profits of, of, of the industry. Um, this is, you know, how, how subsidies are contributing to this decline. Um, so, so I think it's important to, to, to know that, and this is a study from, from Sala and, 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 and Sumaila, from 2018 that, you know, that states that without government subsidies, as much as 51% of, of the high seas uh, fishing will not be uh, profitable. So I think this is important to keep in mind, um, following a little bit on what uh, the folly was, was mentioned earlier. Um, we uh, have been working with Rashid Sumaila uh, on the uh, global subsidy estimates. Um, I'm not going to go in detail about this since uh, Dr. Pai also uh, mentioned this before. But here, just to highlight that uh, if you look at the, the blue uh, bubbles here, most of the of the of the fish uh, of the uh, Fisheries uh, subsidies are uh, provided by developing countries. So, if members decided to, to give extended special differential treatment or flexibility to developing countries, we will not be achieving our objective, which is an ambitious outcome. Um, another way that um, Rashid Sumaila in, in, the, in his uh, estimates established was maybe use the Human Development Index. As a, as a reference, and here the situation changes. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to highlight that as, as, a, as an important element in, you, in your discussions. But just, just, just to say that, you know, um, developing countries also have an important role to play in, in having a su successful agreement. Um, so it's not about developing developed countries. It, this is about um, uh, harmful subsidies that are depleting the, the stocks that, um, that uh, countries depend on. Uh, here, just to highlight that, well, I'm just going to go through these uh, slides just to show that this, this is the by category and subcategory of subsidies as developed by Rashid Sumaila, but I'm not going to stop there. I think this is again, again is by region. Dr. Pauli presented this, this as well. But he just to highlight Asia, Europe, and China looking at individually are the big contributors to, to, the, to the global subsidies estimates. Uh, and finally, before moving to some of the tools that, that Pew has uh, helped to develop, um, as you can see here, this is another study from Anshu Wauer and, and Rashid, um, shows a division you know, of, the, of the global fishery subsidies by large scale and small scale. Um, uh, you can see that you know, substantially um, um, the small scales contribute less uh, on subsidies, but also they have 41% of capacity enhancing subsidies, which is also contributing to our efficient on our capacity. So, so it, I think it's important that members address the, the concerns about uh, providing support for small scale fisheries, 
but there is this 41 percent uh, of uh, hard proficient resources that needs to be addressed as well to try to uh, reduce or efficient our capacity so again uh, even though you know there is the large differences between large scale and small scale small scale also contributes to, to this it's important to keep this in mind so now we have been working with um, the Uni University of California, Santa Barbara. They have been developing, sorry, there's some noise. I don't know if, background noise. I don't know if it's me. <laughs> I'm afraid um, it, we think it might be you, but keep going, it'll be too disruptive to try and get you to change. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, they have developed this, uh, uh, have been developing this uh, model, uh, bioeconomic model to see the, look at the impact of the uh, subsidy reform uh, in on the ground, um, and they have estimated uh, managed to, to, to estimate the, the subsidies per vessel, uh, looking at the Rashid's data, and then looking at the Global Fishing Watch, um, looking at you know the the impact the the, the the fishing effort of the vessels by flag, uh, the time they the, the power and the characteristics of the vessel and the time they are spent on the water, fishing. Um, so they have managed to, to, to estimate the, the subsidies uh, uh, value per, per vessel. Um, and by that, they have been able to see what's the subsidy intensity. And, and here, you can see um, globally uh, that basically there's no, no space in the ocean without uh, a, a subsidy. So every, every vessel that you know uh, after applying this modeling every vessel in the water is is because of subsidies is uh, to some extent uh, 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 have, having some some impact on the resources and so this this is um important to 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 mention how much um you know subsidies are driving this this effort um also as part of the exercise, well, they have developed this tool, as I mentioned, it's, it's called Subsea Explorer. We made a presentation of this uh, tool uh, in June um, last year. We are in the process of updating this uh, tool um, in a way that taking all the proposals that are on the table, um, and then you can click and, and see the impact <clears throat> on on the on, 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 the, on the water. Um, so what, what they have been doing is to, yeah, to model the, the, the removal of capacity enhancing subsidies. So what happens if you remove all capacity enhancing subsidies, uh, which uh, according to Rashid Sumaila is, is uh, there are around $22 billion annually. So they have determined that if, if, if uh, all capacity enhancing subsidies are eliminated, um, the biomass could increase up to 12 percent by 2060 and there will be also an increase in in the catch levels up to 3.3 percent in this graph you can see the impact of some of the proposals and i i don't have here the you know which proposals are, are which but they are divided by category you know ambition uh, reform is the pink one which is in the far uh, right uh, upper left uh, upper right sorry and then you have the proposals on IUU, proposals on overfishing over capacity, other type of proposal included in SND, and the, the ones related to overfish stocks. Um, so you can see the level of ambition of all these uh, proposals as compared to the most ambitious outcome. And we are still far, we're still far. Um, you can see all, also, you know, if you look at the overfish stocks, which is the purple one at the bottom, and you look at it in the graph, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, as well as the IUU disciplines, the impact is very minimal. Um, so that's something that we need to consider. Uh, whether what well, is on the table right now, you know, will have an impact. And unfortunately, it looks like, uh, at least in some instances, the impact will be, will be, will be minimal. It will be uh, releasing this, uh, the new version of this tool in in the coming weeks so you can look at more more closely you know uh, one of you know the different proposals 
but this is this is quite important and I, we hope that this will help also um, uh, members to assess you know uh, the, the impact of the proposals uh, the table and hopefully this will um, uh, uh, look for more ambitious uh, uh, outcomes we also developed based on this information another tool that is called the ACP Atlas for distant water fishing uh, this is just to look at the, the effort uh, and subsidy uh, 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 intensity uh, from distant water fleets in the EECs of the uh, African Caribbean Pacific countries. Uh, for instance, this is uh, just want to put an example. This is the Ghana EEC. And we can see there the origin of the vessels um, that go into the to the this EEC, and then here you can see the the impact of the subsidies, the subsidy intensity. Um, and here just you wanted to highlight the, the, the more yellow is the, the where there's more subsidy intensity and it's close, very close to the shore. Um, so mm -hmm. again, if we are talking about uh, an exemption to the territorial waters, we need to think about this carefully because um, there's in some countries of the region, there's all these distant water fleet that are fishing right, right in the 12, the, between the, around the 12 miles. And if we get an extension to that, we might not be achieving much. So this is also important to highlight. Mm -hmm. Then um, uh, we're developing another tool, and I think um, built by economist called Anthony Rogers, and he gave a presentation at a similar event organized by ISD back in February, if I'm not mistaken, where mm -hmm. he went to to look at the the, the global global fishing. Um, uh, well, um, uh, fishing watch um, data uh, to look at where where the effort was taking place, uh, either in the side EC or in the high seas or or done by distant water fleets, uh, you know, in foreign foreign jurisdictions. And here is the outcome in in, glo in global terms. Most of the effort, as you can see, is in the inside EECs. So mm -hmm. also we need to think about carefully. And members need to think about carefully if, if you put exemptions uh, or flexibilities to the, the fishing in inside the, 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 the jurisdiction, the jurisdiction inside the EECs, how much are we achieving uh, or how ambitious are we going to be? Um, so this is important also to, to highlight as compared to, to uh, because if you add the inside the EECs and the foreign EECs is about 80-85% of the fishing global fishing effort um, so we need to think about, you know, how ambitious we want to be if we are going to re give exemptions or flexibilities to to fish in, inside your your EECs. And we are trying to put this uh, database. I, I think Alice, I, I think I remember correctly, you distributed the database among all, all members. We're trying to put this into a Tableau dashboard, interactive, so you can move around and look at the different outcomes we have divided the previous information into into what is what is the effort you know, the fishing effort inside the ECs, what is done at the domestic territorial waters what is done at the foreign uh, uh, ECs by distant water fleets and what uh, what's the effort in the high seas and you can see the top 10 well by country as well but i've just highlighted here Mm -hmm. the, top, the top 10 countries and, and the effort, uh, the percentage of, of the global effort, and also by region. And, and you can see there um, who are the regions that are contributing. And, and similarly to what uh, Dr. Pali mentioned earlier, Europe and Asia are the ones that are driving most, most, of, most of the effort um, uh, and also most of the subsidies. Um, so so this, is, this is a correlation important to like. Um, so just finally, uh, just to, to mm -hmm. indicate that, you know, from these studies um, and these tools, uh, there, there could be, you know, four conclusions. One is to be ambitious. Um, uh, subsidy reform has a graded, uh, uh, greatest potential, uh, but only if we are ambitious. Um, but we also need to savor that uh, uh, if we give extensions or flexibilities that we do not allow for for excess, excess capacity 
Sorry about that. Hmm. Thank you, Ernesto. Are you still there? Are you having a connection problem? Yeah, I think it's, it's just a... Uh, there's some <clears throat> noise. I think it's my paper when I move my notes around. Um, also, the other point is to report post-subsidy. I think that has to be mentioned uh, today. Um, uh, to think about, it's not about elimination, but also to to move to, to more beneficial subsidies. Um, mm -hmm. To also concentrate on technical and financial assistance to uh, address the concerns uh, of, of the, particularly developing countries in the transition uh, from from harmful subsidies. Uh, and then that uh, is important also to think that uh, subsidy reform is important, but stimulus generally will be even uh, the, the impact will be even greater if members also reform their free trade management. Mm -hmm. And finally, we um, have been working with uh, other NGOs around the world. Um, and we, uh, there are now 158 NGO organizations that have signed this policy statement in support of the negotiations. Um, and this is growing. Um, and, uh, and so we hope that uh, this will highlight the importance of, of members to reach an agreement uh, by the end of the year. Um, and I will I will finish there. I hope I hope I managed to use all the time. But just to say that um, all these findings uh, confirm that the WTO um, uh, has an important. Uh, objective uh, to, to make and, and there is an opportunity to improve the, the health of the oceans uh, but only by being ambitious. Um, the evidence is compelling and we cannot ignore it and the benefits of taking action are very high. Mm. No, thank you very much indeed Ernesto. So with that uh, I think my last job as moderator is simply to thank all of you who've attended. Um, at one point we had 101 participants, um, which is fantastic. I'm delighted. I hope it's been useful for all of you, both here in Geneva and in 